Unless you're raised in a Baptist Sunday school, you probably think that if you believe in God, you should be able to explain why. Ooh, someone has a problem with Baptists, apparently. Damn. What did the Baptists ever do to you? I bet one turned up on his motorcycle in his leather jacket and stole your girlfriend right from under your nose. Every damn time with them. Hmm? What's that? No, I don't know what a Baptist is. Why do you ask? Anyway, yeah, I think if you believe anything, you should at least have some kind of explanation as to why you believe that thing. Even if it's not a very good one, speaking of. Luckily, Christians and other philosophers have been answering this question for over 2,000 years. Christians and other philosophers. What a fucking sentence. As if the term Christian is just another word for philosophy major. When, nah mate, subscribing to a philosophy and being a philosopher are not the same thing. That's like calling all drivers auto mechanics, because they use a car all the time. No, just because you use something doesn't mean you actually understand it. I mean, I use a computer every single day, and look at what's inside. It's clearly witchcraft. Evidentialism tries to argue for God by giving evidence of supernatural events. And that falls flat on its face immediately, because all the evidence for supernatural shit is universally terrible. And no, that's not me arguing that there is no evidence. That's not how evidence works. You can say basically anything is evidence for anything. It's just that, as evidence to explain why I'm so handsome, a glass of water doesn't exactly do much. Now, a big glass of whiskey, on the other hand, for example, a lot of Christians think the resurrection of Christ can be historically proven because there were a lot of eyewitnesses who all died for their faith, and generally people don't die for something they know isn't true. It's funny the way your cadence is. It sounds like you're explaining something you think is really, really dumb. But you're not. That's just how you sound. It's like the curse of the ever-sarcastic tone. I love my family so much. Wait, why are you leaving? I love you all. I'll be so sad when you go. Anyway, yeah, terrible point, assuming those eyewitnesses even exist, which is, you know, and even if them dying for something that they believe to be true, well, that is in no way the same as dying for something that they know to be true. Sometimes people give evidence of supernatural things like demonic possessions, where people start speaking in languages they don't know, or near-death experiences where people see things outside their body that they shouldn't have been able to see. So on the Demon Boys one, you appear to be implying xenoglossy, which is a phenomenon with basically no actual scientific data backing it up, only some anecdotes. But what I think you're really referring to is people talking gibberish, as if it's a language, probably after some form of trauma, either physically or emotionally. And yeah, there's way better explanations than demons do the real. And no near-death experience has again been demonstrated true scientifically. So anecdotes upon anecdotes upon anecdotes. And as we all know, the plural of anecdote is stop being a moron. The moral argument is basically, objective morality is only real if God is real, but objective morality is real, so therefore God is real. If you can prove objective morality without immediately jumping to being subjective as fuck, I will eat this baby. I mean, I was gonna anyway, but I need to have an excuse to lose some goddamn weight. Question. Is cannibalism good or bad? I think it's good. I think it's bad. I think it's good. I think it's bad. Which one of them is correct? Now, I'm assuming you agree with this one. If you don't, please stay away from me. But how do you know that he's actually correct? How do you know that these aren't just different opinions? They are opinions, but it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you have no sense of self-preservation, then it wouldn't matter. But anyone who has built up instincts to not cause themselves great harm and lower their chances of survival by being kicked out of the village will survive better by not doing that. The existence of evolved morality doesn't make morality objective, but it doesn't make morality any less valuable either. It seems to have done a pretty good job of making more human, so obviously it's bad. Our little friend here can only be objectively correct if there is a supreme authority that says cannibalism is bad. And that supreme authority is what we would call God. Oh shit, that's even worse than I expected. It's just objective morality proves God because God is real and makes objective morality. If that argument was any more circular, it would be a fucking pizza. A delicious, delicious baby pizza. Nom nom nom.
The cosmological argument is basically that something must have caused everything else. Everything that happens has a cause, and that has a cause, and that has a cause. So where does this go? Does this go on forever? That's not possible. At some point, there needs to be a first cause of everything else. How do you know that's not possible? Your only experience, your only currently available data, is inside the universe that we currently inhabit. Since you don't know, the best you can say is, it seems. And that is just not good enough to prove dick. There needs to be an unmoved mover, an uncaused causer, an unchanged changer. It needs to be eternal, because if it ever starts or stops existing, that's change, and it can't do that. It needs to be outside the universe, because everything in the universe is caused. It also needs to be all-powerful, because if it can't be moved, but it can move anything else, that means it's all-powerful. And this is what we would call God. Even if we grant your premise, this in no way proves any kind of God, only something that has these attributes, maybe. And on the other side, if a thing can't change, then why did it suddenly make a universe for no reason, after not doing that for an eternity? Oh no, your shit doesn't make sense! Who would have seen that come in? I don't get it. Oh, I get it, it's just f***ing stupid. Okay, let's make it even harder then. Everything is a mixture of act, meaning what it is, and potency, meaning what it could be. For example, a baby actually is alive, and it could be an adult. Do you have any idea how hard you are making it to not make dead baby jokes? Because a baby, even a dead one, is still a f***ing baby, and is still absolutely delicious, but not as delicious without all the squirming. Again, nom nom nom. An apple actually is red, and it has the potency to be eaten. So if you eat an apple, you're actualizing its potency to be eaten. But you also are a mixture of act and potency. For example, you have the potency to be strong, but you're not. I beg your fucking pardon, I'm the strongest in the omniverse. The only reason I don't act on it is because I'm also really fucking lazy. Anytime something changes you, it's actualizing a potency in you. Anytime a change happens, you have one thing actualizing another, but you can't go back forever, so eventually you need to go back to an unactualized actualizer, which we call God. Again, what actualized God to do an anything if it cannot be changed? There has to be a change, otherwise it wouldn't do a thing it wasn't doing. And if it didn't change, it wouldn't do it. Self-defeating arguments are always fun. God is the being that's pure act, meaning he is everything that he possibly could be. This means he must be eternal, because if he's not eternal, that means he has the potential to not exist. But there is no potential in God, so that means God must always exist. Also, if God is everything he could be, he's also all-powerful, because he cannot change. And that means nothing else could possibly do anything to God. Ah, oh, so God must always have created the universe. Wait a second. This argument's the most complicated. It's originally from Aristotle, and it's also used by Thomas Aquinas in Summa Contra Gentiles. I think the word you're looking for is convoluted, and either way, it's still a shit argument for wankers, because again, completely self-defeating nonsense, and complexity is not a synonym for good or smart or correct. Pascal's wager is much simpler, and it's more of a thought experiment than an argument. Just in to say, shit thought experiment for wankers. Continue. Let's say you're an atheist, and atheism turns out to be correct. Nothing happens after you die. Well then, you don't really gain or lose anything, it's just kind of neutral for you. But let's say you're an atheist, and it turns out you're wrong, and God is real, then it could be very bad for you. Now let's say you believe in God, and it turns out atheism is correct, well then you still don't gain or lose anything, it's just neutral. But if you believe in God, and God is real, then you could gain everything. So between these two possibilities, which one do you want to bet on? This one gives you a much better chance, so it's better for you to believe in God. So many things stupid about this. For starters, it shouldn't look like that. It should look like this, a giant mess of possibilities that are all as likely and unlikely, if you don't really think about it, as each other. Making such a choice impossible, because the choice is not does God exist, it's which one, if any, and also does the one that you can believe in care if or what you believe in. And the other major problem is that you think the Christian loses nothing. That is absolutely incorrect. If I spend my one life doing things that make me happy and others happy and the world a better place and bring joy and love to people for its own sake, and you sit in a church thinking about what a piece of shit you are saying sorry for the crime of existing every day to a man that's not even f***ing there, who exactly do you think loses nothing by living their life? And it ain't me. 
The teleological argument says that stuff in the universe seems to have a purpose, so that means the universe must have had a designer. Seeming and being are not the same thing, but do go on. If you found a machine lying around, you would assume that somebody designed the machine. So the teleological argument tries to argue that the universe works like a machine, so somebody must have designed the universe. And it's wrong. First off, we know people design machines because we've seen them do that. But we also know that the universe is not a machine. It is a system. Well, a series of systems. So the fact that it looks one way when studied properly, it's demonstrated that it is in fact not that. Therefore, teleological boys and bad argument. Things in nature, like the human cell or the ecosystem of the world, are very complex and they work like a machine. Now, Darwinian evolution can explain why that is, but there's also things Darwinian evolution can't explain, like the four constants of the universe. I'm sorry, do you think that evolution is in any way trying to explain those things? The fact that it can't is, well, good, because it's not trying to, and if it did, that'd be f***ing weird. But one point for not being a creationist dipshit, I guess, so... There are physical constants, like the gravitational constant and the electron charge, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force, that are perfectly fine-tuned, such that if they were even the slightest bit different, the entire universe would immediately collapse in on itself. Slightest bit meaning, it could be massively different and a universe would still be the do. And also, how do you know that a big difference wouldn't just make something else? Also, also, the fact that just because we might not know where something comes from currently, jumping immediately, well, God must do, is bad braining for masturbators. The ontological argument says God exists because of the way he is. Bruh. No, seriously. God is defined as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That means God must be all-powerful, because being all-powerful is greater than having limited power. God must be all-knowing, because being all-knowing is greater than having limited knowledge. God must be all-good, because being all-good is greater than being flawed. And God must exist, because existing is greater than not existing. Assumption upon assumption. These attributes being the best are from a human perspective. You like existing, so existence and best. What you define as good, I'm not even going to start. And also, the opposite of good isn't flawed, unless you mean all not a piece of junk, which, well, no, you didn't say, and no one means that. They mean the feelings one. And on unlimited power and knowledge, the fact that some of the most interesting things ever created are interesting because of their limitations. But you give someone an infinite playground of possibilities, and all they're going to do is draw a penis. So, you know, it's 50-50 on that one. Wait, just because we can think of a greatest possible being doesn't mean it actually exists. Well, actually it does, because existing in reality is greater than just existing in the mind. Even if existing is the greatest of all things, that does not mean a greatest thing even can exist. It's an assumption, and it doesn't prove shit. Okay, but I could use that to argue for the existence of the greatest possible pizza. Well, actually, no, you can't, because the definition of pizza implies limitations, like a limited size and able to be broken. Pizza is an object of limited size that is able to break. This is pizza. Very smart. Christ, you say some of the dumbest things I have ever heard from a theist dude. It's almost impressive. If you had a pizza that was indestructible, eternal, all-powerful, and infinitely large, it wouldn't be a pizza anymore, it would just be God. Basically, if your pizza gets infinitely great, it'll turn into God. This motherfucker suggesting pizza isn't godlike. Get out of here. There is also the argument from personal experience. Ha, <laughs> sure. It may sound silly, but everyone does see the world through the lens of their own personal experience. Yeah, if only we came up with some sort of system that allows us to ignore personal experience and based our conclusion on facts about reality instead. Unfortunately, I know of no such system. Darn it. A lot of people are convinced God exists either because of supernatural events they've seen, or because of answered prayers, or just coincidences in their life. Why did you say coincidence three times in a row? That was just strange. So this is very good at convincing oneself that God exists, but not very good at convincing other people. I wonder why that could be. Although it's actually not good at convincing people who actually bother to question their own senses, instead of assuming themselves to be faultless and unable to be wrong. You know, idiots. The transcendental argument basically says without God, nothing can make sense at all. 
There's a lot of things we assume, but we can't prove. We assume that logic works. We assume that there's consistency in the natural world. We assume that truth exists, but we can't prove any of these things scientifically, because these are the basic assumptions we need to make to even do science. You don't have to assume any of those things. In fact, the more science we do, the more those things demonstrate themselves to be pretty stable aspects of reality. Now, of course, we can never be 100% sure, but that's just science. It can't be science without being able to be proven wrong. You know, like how God is completely and utterly unscientific. All of these things make sense if we presuppose a worldview where God exists, because then we can say all these other things are grounded in the mind of God. But if God doesn't exist, then we have no justification for the things we assume, and everything just collapses. Nope. The justification is the evidence that continues to be consistent. In fact, if they one day just stopped, or changed, or some other thing, that would be supernatural and would be the first bit of evidence to ever actually be able to prove some kind of thing beyond our universe happening. There is the argument from the mind, or consciousness, which says consciousness cannot be explained naturally. I mean, it can. Where do minds come from? The brain. If the brain's not natural, I don't know what is. Generally, the atheist explanation of consciousness is that our brain is just a very advanced biological machine, but unlike our minds, machines can be reduced to their parts. Now, our brain can be reduced to its brain cells, but that's not the same as the experience of consciousness. For example, you could find a part of our brain that sees the color yellow, but that's not the same as the experience of seeing yellowness. Yeah, and we can't know how a computer experiences things, because we aren't that computer. This is just semantics. Knowing how the brain works mechanically is understanding how the thing works. If we learn all of it, we'll know. Everything else is just humans being so fucking impressed with themselves. You cannot study consciousness scientifically because one can only observe one's own consciousness. For example, there is no way to know if we all see the same colors. Who knows, maybe yellow looks like this to me. Why did you just show yellow non-stop? Anyway, you can't know that won't be something we can dig into and accurately measure in some sense. And even if we can't, the existence of consciousness does not prove a god. And even if it did, that it absolutely doesn't prove which. For all you know, you could be the only person who exists. Oh, I wish. A single atom is not conscious. Two atoms are not conscious. A bunch of atoms are not conscious. So even if you have a complex system, it's still just a complex arrangement of atoms which are not conscious. So where does consciousness come from? Yet more semantics, like try to define a person. Every way that you try to define it, like your stupid pizza analogy, you will be inherently describing something that some people don't meet, but they're still people. The same way that a complex system producing consciousness doesn't have a start point, but many, many points along its journey. Simple systems to more complex systems. Animals have varying degrees of awareness, and some are absolutely and obviously possessing that you would describe as consciousness. It's not special. That doesn't make it any less interesting. And even if it's completely inexplicable, it won't prove anything other than we haven't explained it yet. So this isn't exactly an argument for God, but it is an argument for the human soul because it shows you need something immaterial to explain consciousness. Need is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. That is doing all of it, because it's bollocks. Then there's the argument from mathematics, which says there's an infinite reality higher than our physical universe. So basic math isn't all that special. For example, the number 5 corresponds to 5 apples, and 5 times 3 corresponds to 3 groups of 5 apples. Pfft, look at this mofo showing off that he can do apples, or maths, or whatever it is. Smartest Theist Award goes to... But the more you get into advanced math, the more math starts to get disconnected from our world, but it still works. For example, there's real numbers, which are numbers that correspond to real things, but there's also imaginary numbers that are just as mathematically real, but they don't correspond to the real world, which is why they're not called real numbers. But they still exist mathematically, even though they don't exist in the real world. As far as I can tell, and this is from a non-maths boy, his conclusion here is total f***ing gibberish. Imaginary numbers seem to be a tool to solve certain equations for a number of reasons, but absolutely no one who actually knows 
dick about maths that I have seen says anything about them being unrelated to reality and are actually able to help describe it. But again, I could be wrong. Still wouldn't prove any god, although using something called imaginary to try and do so is really funny. Let's look at the five most important numbers in mathematics. One is obviously important because it's the basis for all real numbers. Zero is very important because it's necessary for doing algebra. I is very important because it's the basis for all imaginary numbers. E is very important for doing exponential functions, and pi is necessary for doing math with circles. None of these things are whiskey, so they shall be ignored. Now all these numbers are seemingly unrelated to each other, but they fit together beautifully in this equation called Euler's identity. It was discovered by Euler, one of the greatest mathematicians in history, and he saw this as proof that math was designed by God. So I did look that up, and the guy seems to be a smart boy and his thing is like, good and all that? And I am 100% not going to try and pronounce the name because, what, you think I'm crazy? But no matter how smart and elegant a mathematical thing is, all that means is that you can do that. Even if it's the most elegant and descriptive of reality and unifying equation, all it means is that we've done that equation. A universe could 100% be that way with no need to do a god. Honestly, it's some of the laziest thinking possible. It's like saying, here's some accurate physics, therefore god. It's nothing. Also, Euler was a devout Calvinist. More evidence that math has a designer is the Mandelbrot set, which is generated by a very simple equation in the complex plane, but it produces infinite detail. You can keep zooming in on this shape and it will keep generating more and more complexity, even though nobody designed this. Uh, isn't that like the opposite of what you said earlier? Would that not prove that a thing can have infinite complexity without being designed? Hmm. Also, technically, so will a perfect circle. It's just a lot less interesting to look at. The Mandelbrot set is infinite, and it's not found anywhere in our universe, so that means whatever created it must also be infinite and not from our universe. It is literally from our fucking universe. What are you talking about? It's just maths. It's not magic, for fuck's sake. So those are the common arguments for God, and by the way, this video wasn't intending to make any of these arguments. It would take a much longer video to do any of these arguments justice. Nah, 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 you don't get a weasel out of it like that. Of course you're making them, you just aren't going in depth. The problem is, you could have an infinite amount of time to make these arguments, and they would still be kind of shit. Bye! Wait, before you go, I have something super important to tell you. It's life or death, it will change everything forever! Nope. Wait, it's gone. Oh well, probably wasn't important. But while I have you, don't forget to comment, subscribe, and notify. And if you want more of my smexy voice, check out Mrs. Six's channel, Spoon Star Stories, where I narrate and voice all the videos. And she does the work. And if you want to support the channel, check out the merch store for cool t-shirts, or check out Patreon, memberships, and PayPal to support directly. Finally, Follow me on the medias of social to get completely pointless guff and to keep up on the latest releases. Oh, I just remembered what I was going to tell you. Whatever you do, don't touch the-